Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Covenant Calendar. We're going to be looking at an interesting study today with Laban. Laban's quenched rage. What does that quenched rage do? This, uh, it confirms creation's covenant of the day and covenant of the night. Two covenants we have to pay specific attention to. And this is a teaching from Yah's Covenant Calendar. And of course, you can always visit studythecalendar.com and there's lots of studies there free, every one of them. Yahuwah's word is free. A spiritual darkness reveals Yahusha's dawn to dawn light. Whose spiritual darkness is that? And how can it reveal dawn to dawn? Well, it's Laban's blindness, his spiritual darkness that reveals Yahushua's light. So let's have a look at it and enjoy this simple study. It was this blind ambition which plainly laid out Yahuwah's cycle schedule set forth at creation. Genesis 31, when we read there, we see there was speckled and streaked blessings brilliantly exposed the start of Yahuwah's cycles and his shanae. What is shanae? That's the Hebrew word for year. And you see that word first in Genesis 1.14. The lights are to be for Shanae. Yahuwah caused Yaakov to be very prosperous while serving his father-in-law, Laban. That very blessing aroused agitating friction among the sons of Laban, and they suggested to Laban that Yaakov was taking advantage of the situation. Laban, who served gods made by human hands, was highly susceptible to their influence. He initially disregarded that Yaakov served the Elohim of Tseva, the one and only Almighty. Laban had become agitated towards Yaakov. And then, well, let's read Genesis 31.3. And Yahuwah said to Yaakov, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I am with you. I am with you. Yaakov gathered his family and explained to them how it was that Yahuwah caused the livestock to flourish in colorful specifications, creating a separate and fully distinguishable flock from that of Laban and his family. That factor birthed the contention between Yaakov and Laban's family. So what caused the hard sentiment in this event? Well, let's read Genesis 31. And the messenger of Elohim spoke to me in a dream, saying, Yaakov. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the El of Bethel, where you anointed the standing column. See that in Genesis 28, 18. And where you made a vow to me. Now rise up. Get out of this land and return to the land of your relatives. And Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, You still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not reckoned by him as strangers? For he has sold us and also entirely consumed our silver. Genesis 3.16 For all the wealth which Elohim has taken from our fathers are ours and our children's. Now then, do whatever Elohim has told you. So Yaakov rose and put his sons and his wives on camels. And he drove off all of his livestock and all his possessions, which he had acquired, his property of the livestock, which he had acquired in Padan Aram, to go to his father Yitzhak in the land of Canaan. And when Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole the house idols that were her father's. And Yaakov deceived Laban the Aramean because he did not inform him that he was about to flee. And he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilead. 
And on the third day, Laban was told that Yaakov had fled. Laban was justifiably upset that his offspring had left without notice. The flocks in contention were removed. And most importantly, to Laban, his gods of wood and stone had vanished at the same time. Laban was hot with anger at being deceived and had full intentions of bringing forth justice of his own determination. So how do we know that? Well, verse 23. Then he took his brothers with him and pursued him for seven days' journey. And he overtook him in the mountains of Gilad. There was an intense chase. Seven days of intense chase. Please note, that Yahuwah knew very well of Laban's deeper evil intentions. Verse 24. But in a dream, when? By night, Elohim came to Laban, the Aramean, and said to him, Guard yourself that you do not speak to Yaakov either good or evil. Note carefully. This dream, by night, H3915, the word is Leel. The timing of this dream will become paramount for understanding Yahuwah's seven dawn-to-dawn -dawn cycles which formulate a completed week. So the time frame of Yahuwah's communication in a dream to Laban. That's night, H 3915, Lael. The definition, night. Night as opposed to day. Quite simple, but it becomes very important. Now to read the narration that took place between Laban and Yaakov. Genesis 31, 25. Then Laban overtook Yaakov. Now Yaakov had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brothers pitched, it, pitched in the mountains of Gilad. And Laban said to Yaakov, What have you done that you have deceived me? and driven my daughters off like captives taken with the sword. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not inform me? And I would have sent you away with joy and songs and with tambourine and leader. But you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have been foolish to do this. Laban speaks very directly to Yaakov very directly. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you, but, but the Elohim of your father spoke to me. Laban, who had sunk into idol worship, understood clearly exactly who Yahuwah is. Further on, Laban, Laban did show a good measure of respect for Elohim of Yaakov, but we're going to see that in, in a few minutes. Laban knew he could physically overpower and destroy Yaakov. Yet, because Laban had witnessed the power of Yahuwah through the prosperity and numbers of Yaakov's flock, Laban knew very well that he had best listened to the dream given to him. When Yahuwah, when, or no, when did Yahuwah speak to Laban? When was that? Verse 29. Let's have a visual here. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you, but the Elohim of your father spoke to me when? Last night. Last night. Laban related Yahuwah's dream factor to Yaakov in the light season. When was the last night? That word is H570, Emesh. Yahuwah gave the dream to Laban last night. Please note the dawn in the middle. The dawn is where the ox and the plow split, where the belt buckle is. That's dawn. The word there that we sometimes read uh, in the Geneva, in the KGV, and the bishops is yesternight. Kind of an interesting word. We don't hear that anymore. It's very uncommon to hear that. But it's actually a very good word. Laban and Yaakov were speaking in the light season, immediately following the H3915, Lael, the night season of the dream. 
How do we know this? Well, let's look at the Hebrew word for yesterday. We're going to go into our Strong's here. H570 Emesh. It's an adverb. If we look down on the right here, this word is translated to us as yesterday. This is taken from the Blue Letter Bible online app. Notice that the word emesh was originally translated as yesternight. Looking for the word emesh here from Strong's again, because Strong's is popular and people are, people are able to look this up for themselves. Emesh, time passed. Interesting. Would that be split by the oxen plow at dawn? Last night. Former time. There's a split somewhere. Where is it? Note here. First or second Kings 31, 29, and 42. That's what we're talking about. Now, read this. It denotes the latter part of the today. No, that's not what it says. It denotes the latter part of the previous natural day. How come we have not been paying attention to this? And Jesenius illustrates and compares Emesh. So we're going to compare here Emesh to do at evening as used of tomorrow. In the Hebrew, there's the word boker in the morning and tomorrow. There's a split here somewhere. Would it be boker, the dawn? Is that where the ox and the plow split the 24 hour cycle? Emesh. Night, darkness, interesting. What does the Hebrew look like? Here we see from the interlinear scripture analyzer, so we can make sure of what we're looking at. Last night, Amesh. And the Hebrew lexicon by John Parkhurst. The arrow here brings us down to make sure we have the exact same letters, no mistake. Amesh, to recede. Time passed. Uh-oh. There's a, there's a split, a division somewhere if it's past. If it was time present, that would be different. But this is time past. John Parkhurst references the texts of Genesis 19.34, chapter 31.42, and 2 Kings 9, 20, verse 26, in his definition of the word amesh. Interestingly, these texts also show a context of a separate time frame other than when the speaker speaking was done. Yes, Strong's shows definitions also, yet they are not as clarifying. What does yester mean? Interesting word. Have you ever heard that today? No, not very often. But what does it mean? Here is the online etymo etymological dictionary. Yester. Old English, yesterday. Let's jump down to the underline and the emphasize words. Originally, the other day. Reckoned from today. From. Hmm. There's a division right here. Either backward or forward. Where is that division? Where is the split? What word causes it? Note that the other day strongly indicates a 24-hour period separate from the existing one. Yesternight will reflect this meaning in realizing the previous 24-hour period other than which is spoken on the present one. So how come we've been reading these words for years and we haven't clued in? Is it something to do with just listening to our traditions? and not questioning, not getting serious about our study in Scripture? What does that word mean? Why was it used? How come it doesn't agree with what I heard at the pulpit? Shouldn't we be questioning these things? Your father, your fathers have inherited lies. Are we paying attention to that verse? Let's question more often. Yesternight. Yesternight in American English, it's a noun and an adverb. And I like this, it says archaic. Yeah, the night before today. 
last night, an obvious division, a distinguishment. Why do we say today and tonight, but not yesternight? Well, today and tonight is inclusive. Yesternight is exclusive. Huge difference. Yester does not support an inclusive meaning. Yester indicates having been distinguished as separate. Where is the cycle separator? Genesis 31, verse 29. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you, but the Elohim of your father spoke to me. When? Yesternight. Yesternight. Where is that division? Where is the ox and the plow? This night season over here was a different and on a previous weekly cycle. This is where Yahuwah gave a dream to Laban. And then we come to the ox and the plow. Well, you don't see a picture of an ox and a plow there, but we do have the word boker, which does the splitting so that we can have the word yesternight. It was in this light season right here in the blue box that Laban related Yahuwah's dream factor to Yaakov in this blue season. I should say in the blue light season. <laughs> what divine institution separated, divided, and distinguished these two different cycles of the week? Have we yet realized right from creation week that the dawn was and still is the separating point of reckoning according to Yahuwah. No, you don't hear that on many teachings today because Yahuwah has been set aside and the key to understanding has been removed. Do we accept that? Or do we look at the words in the scriptures and say, why is that word there? Why does it not agree with what I have been taught? Well, let's have a look at the consensus here. Yahuwah provided the boker, that's dawn, at creation for determining the cycles of the week. Dawn is the divider. It's the belt buckle. The belt goes fully around the waist, and it comes to a belt buckle where there's a split, a division. Does it connect? Oh, yes. It connects so that you can have seven cycles of the week. But it is divided, it is split, and it is distinguished from each of the other six. Well, over here, the Amesh, or the yesternight, is when Yahuwah gave a dream to Laban. Again, this light season here, the blue light season, is when Laban related, or he spoke Yahuwah's dream factor to Yaakov. This 24-hour cycle in the yesternight was finished at the point of its first light above the dark horizon. Dawn brings the light of the next cycle. On the former night season, which was the previous 24-hour cycle, that's by definition, Yahuwah issued protection for Yaakov in the form of a dream. Recall chapter 31, verse 2, the promise that he gave. And I am with you. He fulfilled that with perfection. Perfection, isn't that the rock that was given to the breastplate for Aharon, the Thumim? Perfection. Well, he fulfilled that promise with perfection. I am with you, and he gave a dream of protection. I am with you. What was Laban's major darkness? Genesis 31.30. And now you have gone be because... Sorry, let me start that again. And now you have gone because you have you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my mighty ones? Remember, he's still upset. Yaakov consequently declares this. With whomever you find your mighty ones, do not let them live. In the presence of our brothers, see for yourself what is with me and take it with you. For Yaakov did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Laban 
was incensed that his God, notice this, his God had been removed from his house. Worshipping pagan gods and graven images was Laban's evil darkness. Yes, that's in black for a specific purpose. Laban's evil darkness. And he desperately wanted his darkness back. Blindness. Interestingly, Laban did have a certain level of respect for his daughter, Rachel. When she declared her situation as that of a monthly time of a lady, Laban did not force her to stand up. Whether this time was the truth or not, we do not know. But the fact is that she did not have to stand up and reveal anything. Once again, Yahuwah protected Yaakov from severe grief. Yahuwah is in the business of bringing forth good results out of very, very awkward situations. That was one of them. In verse 36 to 41, the intense feelings between Laban and Yaakov were voiced passionately. Let's examine verse 42. Yaakov speaks a second witness, a confirmation. Yaakov concludes his defense towards Laban. Genesis 31, verse 42. Unless the Elohim of my father, the Elohim of Abraham, and the fear of Yitzhak had been with me, you would have sent me away empty-handed. Elohim has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands, and he rendered judgment when? Last night. Amesh. He's referencing the Boker division. He recognizes that the dawn separates the day and the night. It's a daily belt buckle, if you will. It splits and divides. The Amesh, the yesternight, was before the division. It was before the dawn. That was the night of Laban's dream. So simple when we see it visually, when we understand the words. And yet for years we've gone over this and never clued in. Yaakov's witness confirms Genesis 1, and this is very noteworthy. Yaakov did not consider the previous night season as integral with the light season of high contention dialogue with Laban. Yaakov spoke of the dream night as being separated and divided by the Boker dawn light, exactly as Yahuwah stipulated at creation. He wrote it very, very clearly. And yet that's another place where we have read over and over, time and time again. We have not clued in. The light season of contentious conversation was what? Separated from the dream night by the dawn, separated. Laban, recalling Yahuwah's command in the dream, decides to lead out and diffuse the situation. Interesting that Laban would try to diffuse it. Let's hear what he says. And Laban answered and said to Yaakov, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children. And this flock is my flock, and all that you see is mine. But what shall I do today to these, my daughters, or to their children whom I have born? Now we come to an extremely important portion of this event, the covenant. The four scriptural components of an everlasting covenant. And I hope that each one is paying attention to these four components. Because when you read through the scripture and you see the word covenant or you understand that a covenant is being formed, I would encourage you to note where was the proposal? Where is the acceptance? Was there an anointing as a blood sacrifice? And what about the sealing meal? Are all four of these components in the covenant? 
And is it formed like an ancient suzerain treaty? These four components must be in a solid covenant. Genesis 31, 44. Note these words, and now, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. Note this word, make. This is what we receive, we receive in English, make. Yeah, that's, yeah, make some. Pretty bland, isn't it? Let's look at it deeper. The covenant. The first scriptural component of their covenant, and that's the proposal. There must be a proposal. Genesis 31, 44. And now, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. Note that even Laban recognized the authority of the ancient suzerain treaty system of that era. This is the same type of agreement that Yahuwah met Abraham with on his level. Abraham understood the authority of an ancient suzerain treaty. And the Genesis 15 covenant was formed in that style so that Abraham knew the absolute top authority of that covenant. It had the four components. Does this covenant here with Laban, is it going to have the same? Let's have a look. The second scriptural component of their covenant, the acceptance. Genesis 31, 45. So Yaakov took a stone and set it up as a standing column. A standing column. A permanent structure. Yaakov recalled the words of Yahuwah and said, I am with you. Sorry, I shouldn't have and said. Let me read that one more time. Yaakov recalled the words of Yahuwah, and I am with you. And he immediately accepted Laban's proposal because he understood that proposal was influenced by Yahuwah. Genesis 31, 46. And Yaakov said to his brothers, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. Yaakov wrestled with Yahusha, after which he made a vow, and then raised a commemorative stone and anointed it. Once again, on account of the covenant, Yaakov raised up a stone column to permanently witness the blood covenant event and location with Laban. We'll be returning to the last part of verse 46 soon, but we need to look at the narration of this event first, Genesis 31, 47. And Laban called it Yagar Sahudutha, but Yaakov called it Galed. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why its name was called Galed. Well, if we look in the Decenius lexicon, that word, hill of witness. Rocks are witnesses. There's a frequency in them that they can record what happens around them. That's hard for us to understand because we don't understand that technology today. But when, that, when the scripture tells you that those rocks were a witness. You can be absolutely, positively certain that they had the ability to record the event. Genesis 31, 48. That is why its name was called Galed. Genesis 31, 49. Also, Mitzvah. Because he said, Let Yahuwah watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. Interesting. Let Yahuwah watch. Well, what about this word, watch? If we look at the Hebrew lexicon from W.H. Barker, from 1776, that word is watching or a watchtower. 
Have you noticed that even though Laban worshipped graven images in this verse, he consented full authority to Yahuwah in observing the future interactions between him and Yaakov? Can this picture be summarized as syncretism by Laban? Remember, Laban worshipped his other gods, and they were brutally important to him. Yet here, here Laban allowed authority to Yahuwah, and he spoke it out. Is this even more evidence of syncretism, paganism, and some divinity? Laban defines more covenant details between him and Yaakov, Genesis 31, verse 50. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, Elohim is witness between you and me. Verse 51. And Laban said to Yaakov, See this heap and see this standing column which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this standing column is a witness, that I do not pass beyond this heap to you, and you do not pass beyond this heap and this standing column to me for evil. Note the trust and faith in the witness of these stones. They believed absolutely 100% that these stones had the ability to convey witness. Laban speaks and his final covenant statement. The Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Nahor, and the Elohim of their father rightly rule between us. And Yaakov swore by the fear of his father, Yitzhak. And Yaakov clarified his oath by the Elohim, that is, Yahuwah, of his father, Isaac, or Yitzhak, so there could be no mistake upon whom his allegiance was given. He was not going to allow any mistake at all. It was Yahuwah that was in his sight. Here, Laban divided authority unto Yahuwah alongside the no-gods associated with Haran, that would be Terah's son, to be the watchman between these two men forming their covenant. But why Haran? Haran was the original vendor of these images that were then passed to his daughter Milcha through to Bethuel, the father of Laban. And Laban had a very high importance on these false gods. But let's continue. And what of the covenant being formed? Is there one more item that we must look at? We have seen the first two components. So what is the third? Would it be an anointing? What type of anointing would that be? Is there blood involved? Is there death when there's bloodshed? And what would that death mean? Would it indicate that there is a sentence of death for the one breaking the covenant? Is that what this bloodshed sacrifice is all about? Genesis 31, verse 54. And Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain. Yes, there was blood. Pretty serious. That can mean a death sentence for the one that breaks the covenant. Once again, this is an ancient suzerain-type treaty which has the four components identical to the one Yahuwah commanded to Abram. Yahuwah integrated the ultimate type of authority which Abram recognized at that time. Yahuwah met Abram where he was at psychologically. This blood covenant between Laban and Yaakov was no different. It held the exact same level, sorry, level of authority. You cross this covenant and you can die. Death. It's serious. The anointing. Genesis 31, 54. And Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain. 
this sacrifice was also divided in two halves. The two men were required by the type of official treaty that it was to walk between the two halves of the blood sacrifice, thereby authorizing and verifying the authenticity of it. This treaty also had a death penalty for the one who chose to violate that treaty. It doesn't get any more serious. How do we know this sacrifice was split? The same as Yahuwah's covenant as given to Abraham. Remember that word make? He pointed out that, that very bland word, make. So how do we know this sacrifice was split? Well, let's have a look at the interlinear scripture analyzer, Genesis 15, 18. Check this word that was used in the covenant with Abraham. The word is H3772, karat. Cut. That's what we get in English. He cut. Karat is the Hebrew. Let's look at it. From Jesenius to cut. Coming down to the underline here. So used from slaying and dividing the victims, as was customary in making a covenant, making karat, to cut. So when you hear to cut a covenant, you know that there's a blood sacrifice. Laban spoke here in Genesis 31, 44, and he said, And now let us karat. Well, in English, we have make. Let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. The sacrifice was to be divided in half to facilitate the two men passing between the two halves. Karat, we shall cut. We see the same word, karat, being used in this covenant, the four identical, sorry, the four identical components recorded, and the full authority given to Yahuwah by Yaakov. This pattern clearly shows the covenant was also split and contained the death penalty for the one who broke it. We have seen three of these scriptural components. There's the proposal, the acceptance, and the anointing, which is a blood sacrifice. Three of them. Let's look at number four, the meal of confirmation. Every sacri- or every covenant, every proper authority or authoritative, authoritative <laughs> I can't speak that word properly, authoritative covenant must have a meal of confirmation. Did they have that in Mount Sinai? Yeah, we remember there are the 70 elders, that's actually 75 altogether, where they had the meal on the mount. What about this covenant, the meal of confirmation? For the fourth segment, we must view the last part of Genesis 31, 46 for the first witness of component number four, Genesis 31, verse 46. And Yaakov said to his brothers, gather stones. And they took the stones and made a heap. Now note what they did. And they ate there. On the heap, they ate. It sound like a meal to you? As in the covenant with Abram, there was also a sealing meal here. What about the second meal witness of Laban and Yaakov? Genesis thirty-one fifty-four, and Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain and called his brothers to eat. To eat the bread, and they ate bread and spent the night on the mountain, and they ate bread. There's your covenant-confirming meal. They ate it. There is our fourth component of the ancient suzerain covenant. This covenant is complete. Abram had one, Laban and Yaakov had one, and the next major covenant would be at Mount Sinai. Yet Abram's covenant had a 400-year timeline Genesis 15, 13 will tell you about that. And it was built in to that covenant, spoken by Yahuwah, until the meal of confirmation was eaten 
at the Passover of Mitzrayim, quite a distance later. Now, the covenant investigation between Laban and Yaakov has been completed. But what about dawn to dawn? Let's have a look. Let's get a visual going here. I'm a visual person, and I helps me to learn. Here in this light season, Laban furiously chased Yaakov. There's our sunset. Night follows. Yahua gave a stern warning in a dream to Laban. And I don't believe it was spoken softly. I believe it was spoken very solidly. Maybe not mean, but it was spoken firmly. You do not touch Yaakov. Then comes along the dawn. The next 24-hour cycle had arrived. The dawn saw that ox and the plow splitting the, the 24-hour cycles. Ox and a plow, for some of you may not have heard that. When you go into the Hebrew definition of boker, one of the definitions is a plow, an ox pulling a plow. Why? It splits and it divides. It distinguishes one side of the field from another. That's the purpose for the word boker at dawn. It splits and it divides. So here we see the next 24-hour cycle had arrived. When was that dream? It was before the previous, or is before the dawn. It was yesternight. It was in the previous 24-hour cycle when Yahuwah gave the stern warning to Laban. Yesternight. I like that word. Yaakov and Laban hash out a heated, they had a heated contention and a decision is made to cut karat, a covenant of peace. The four components were recorded the stealing meal was eaten, and they stayed the night on the mountain. Is that all there is to it? And Yaakov brought an offering on the mountain and called his brothers to eat bread, and they ate bread and spent the night on the mountain. Is there more to this? Yaakov and Laban camp out, or so to say, when did Laban arise to leave? Are we given another indication? Genesis 31, 55. And Laban rose up early in the morning and kissed his son and daughters and blessed them. And Laban left and returned to his place. Interlinear scripture analyzer. Genesis 31, 55. What is that word for, for when we read here, rose up early in the morning? Well, we come down to here. He is rising early, 7925. We know that when Moshe arose early to converse with Pharaoh, it was Boker at the break of dawn. Is Laban's timing the same? He rose up early. Here's the word Boker. In the morning, exact same timing at dawn. So Laban rose up early at dawn to leave. He kissed his sons and his daughters and he blessed them. And Laban left and returned to his place. What does Boker indicate? And what are the definitions? Well, from, from J. Parkhurst's Lexicon, in 1762, Boker is to break forth. Not just kind of peeking above the horizon. No, it's to break forth. The light comes above the darkness. It bursts out. As Job says, the eyelashes of dawn are searching out the land. To break forth. At what point does the light break forth through the darkness of the night? Are there other definitions that describe dawn? There it is. The breaking forth of lore, of light, morning, daybreak, and dawn. Does it get any clearer? How many times do we need to read these words and just go over them and not realize the importance that they have? 
Boker, no, the, uh, to cleave, to divide. The notion of cleaving, laying open, isn't that what a plow does? Laying open. It's in this root, transferred to signify. Here we go. To cleave the soil, to plow. There's your plow that splits and divides. What pulls a plow? An ox. Here's your definition in the word boker. This is what causes the dawn to split the 24-hour periods. This is what this is how we understand from Genesis 1 that the dawn started the new days, the new 24-hour cycles. Coming down to the second one here, to burst forth, to break forth light. Hence, Boker morning. It's pretty clear when we look at the definitions. Can we see that Boker means to divide, separate, and split apart, lay open? as in distinguishing different identities. The dawn period of the 24-hour cycle is the only 24-hour portion that contains these definitions. There is no other. The dawn is like a belt buckle. It brings things together, holds things together, but it also divides and separates, distinguishes. The 24-hour cycle fulfills a complete circuit and then is split apart by the ox pulling a plow. There's a picture of dawn's light breaking forth. I took that picture. I was absolutely amazed. I walked out in my deck, I saw that, and I, boy, it, I got back and got my camera pretty quick. That's your dawn. That's your light breaking forth, bursting out. Dawn is likened to an ox and plow. One side is completed. See, if you look at that field below there, one side is turned over. It's plowed up. It's, it's distinguished. The next portion is the future. It's to be conquered. So if you look at that place where that plow is in the ground, and you see raw dirt on one side, and you see grass on the other, that's the dawn if you will. That's the action of splitting and dividing. That's Boker. So if you come on to this, this definition over here in the pink underline, or let's go up in the pink box here first. Boker. Beit Kufresh. Boker. As used for plowing. So-called as cleaving the ground with a plow. Boker. Dividing, splitting, and distinguishing. When you apply this word to time, as in the days of the week, this is what you get right here in the yellow. Dawn. The bursting forth of light. What part of dawn, or boker, have we missed in the last 2,700 years? Who taught us? that the boker had no importance. Who was that? And another in question, why did we even listen? Have we not questioned? This verse, Luke eleven fifty two, 52, you have removed the key of knowledge. Who removed it? And why? If the understanding of boker was removed, how easy is it to give us a sunset and say, oh yeah, well, here's your start of the day in darkness. Does it get pretty important to understand the words that we read? They're not just simple words. Well, maybe the English ones are. But the Hebrew words have a serious depth of understanding that we have been missing for years. Yaakov and Laban's contentious day, which turned into a covenant of peace, started at dawn, Boker. For the ensuing night season of camping on the mount, there are no Hebrew words that indicate in any way, shape, or form of a separate action. There are no Hebrew definitions that would distinguish the night season as on a separate 
24 hour period from the previous light season. It doesn't exist. Laban arose at Boker at the break of the day, as in Yahushua's words, where, where there are many various evidences and equal examples. Read also Genesis 32, 24, chapter, sorry, Genesis 32, verse 24, 26, and 31. And at the very beginning of the new cycle of the week, to begin his journey home, that's when Laban left at dawn, the break of day. He didn't sleep in until 9, 10, 12 o'clock. He was up at the crack of dawn. That's what we have these days, the terminology, at the crack of dawn. That's when that first light breaks up the, the darkness, the crack of dawn. Yahushua told us when the break of day is. Here's a visual. This comes from the from the, the Messianic Testament, probably best, best visualized, Matthew 28, 1. The word epiphosco, at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to what? Grow light. That's boker. It's no other time it can be. The end of the Sabbath started to, the end of the Sabbath stopped and the first day of the week grew light. Boker, dawn, there's that ox in the plow. Splitting, dividing, distinguishing. Sunset doesn't do that. Just the dawn. May Yahuwah bless, guide, and give you wisdom and understanding to set up your pillars for him. And if you have any questions and comments, you can send this to me at studythecalendar.com. And I want to thank you for your time. I know your time is precious. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom.